The police officer charged with murder in the shooting of an unarmed black man has just made his first court appearance. Ray Tensing pleaded not guilty in Samuel DeBose's death. His bond was set at $1 million. Tensing is accused of killing DeBose during what started as a routine traffic stop on July 19th. Now, according to the Hamilton County prosecutor, the key piece of evidence that led to Tensing's arrest was his own body camera, which the DA says contradicts the initial story he gave. In the footage released yesterday. Tensing approaches DeBose's car after pulling him over for a missing front license plate. He asks DeBose for his license, which DeBose says he does not have on him. The situation escalates when Tensing asks him to get out of the car. Within a matter of seconds, the officer pulls his gun and shoots DeBose in the head. Tensing later told the responding officers that he was dragged by DeBose's car, but yesterday the Hamilton County District Attorney said that was not the case. I've been doing this for over 30 years. This is the most asinine act I've ever seen a police officer make. Totally unwarranted. It was... It's an absolute tragedy. Um, in the year 2015, that anyone would behave in this manner. It was senseless. This office has probably reviewed upwards of a hundred police shootings, and this is the first time that we thought this is a this is without question a murder. Tensing's attorney is calling the charge, quote, absolutely unwarranted and points to this video, apparently from another officer's body cam that was posted online by the Cincinnati Inquirer. It appears to show Tensing on the ground, but the attorney acknowledges it does not show him being dragged. He was afraid that he was going to lose his own life. He thought he was going to be run over by Mr. DeBose's car as it sped away. It didn't slowly move away, as I heard Mr. Dieters describe it. It sped away. NBC's Rahema Ellis joins me now from Cincinnati. So, Rahema, what is next for um, Tensing, his next court appearance? His next court appearance, Tamara, will be on August 19th at 9 a.m., following that arraignment he had today that lasted only three minutes, in which time, as you point out, he entered a plea of not guilty to the charges. And his defense attorney pleaded also for a low bond amount to be set, saying that his client is a lifelong resident of Cincinnati, that he graduated cum laude from his class, and that he is a, a kid who has no records whatsoever. In fact, as we now know, he was a former police officer. The judge said in this particular instance because it was a murder case. She set that bond at $1 million and in order to get out on bail, this uh, defendant now will have to come up with at least 10% of that and that's about $100,000. And Rahima, we could tell from the press conference yesterday with the mayor and prosecutor, other city leaders, um, this city is, is trying to, I think in their words, get right what other cities have gotten wrong in the handling of these incidents through the judicial system as well as the understanding of how the community sees these um, acts against unarmed individuals in most, or if not all, cases that we've covered as of late, African Americans. Yes, without question, and I should point out that there was a passionate but peaceful and small protest last night. Uh, a small protest broke out here following the arraignment. There were officers out just in case some kind of violence erupted. None of that happened. To your point about authorities trying to get ahead of this, the family of the victim, Samuel DuBose's family, has called for people to be peaceful in their protest, saying he was a peaceful man and would not like any violence to erupt in his name.
they are also calling, I should tell you, Cameron, that the other officer who witnessed this and who was siding with Ray Tenzing, saying that Tenzing was being dragged and feared for his life, protesters are saying that officer should also be charged for, in their words, not telling the truth. All right, we're here my LS Live Force in Cincinnati. Thank you so much. And joining me now, Washington Post reporter Wesley Lowry and president and CEO of the NAACP, Cornell Brooks. And Cornell, I should note that uh, you and others are taking out on an 860-mile journey for justice um, that's yes. going to kick off August 1st. Uh, this is just on the one-year anniversary of Michael Brown's death. So the timing of this is also intriguing. So let me start, though, Wesley, with the numbers that have been reported in your paper. According to the paper, 500. 58 fatal shootings by police so far just this year. Of that number, the death of Du Bois is the only the fourth to result in criminal charges against an officer. From the Eric Garner case to Mike Brown, we've talked a lot about the relationship that prosecutors have with police departments and officers. And here yesterday was something very different than what we've seen, I think, in any of these cases and how the prosecutor handled this. Of course, and it speaks to the power and the impact of cameras. Um, what we've seen in all four cases, again, 558 as of yesterday. There were probably two or three more last night, so that number will go up in just an hour or two when we update our database. But of the four cases this year where there have been charges for an officer who killed someone in a shooting while on duty, all four cases um, have the shooting captured on video, either on a body camera or a bystander camera. And one of the reasons is, one, you certainly do have these close relationships between prosecutors and police officers officers and, and police departments, but you also have this issue very often of police officers saying things in, in their reports that are not quite true, that is then contradicted by body camera footage. We saw this in Walter, with Walter Scott in South Carolina, where the officer laid out one narrative, and in fact, that was not true based on the video we saw, and we saw this in Cincinnati, where the officer claimed things that the prosecutor is now saying clearly are not shown in this body camera video, empowering him to bring charges. In fact, the mayor of Cincinnati John Cramley was on with my colleague Chris Hayes last night. He was asked would there be a different outcome if that body camera did not record what we've all watched. Let's play his reaction. I don't know, Chris. And, and uh, this is, as I said earlier today, an endorsement for body cameras all across the country. Body cameras brought not a certain agenda, but the truth. The fact is that in so many cases around the country, the issue is what actually happened. Right. And we've been through tough times. We are not a perfect city. We're not right. a perfect situation. But we have made imp improvements, and body cameras will help us make even more improvements. Right. Well, Cornell, it's interesting, as I pointed out, you have this march on the one-year anniversary of Michael yes. Brown's death, and you still have people who say, what happened there? You have the Freddie Gray incident, even though some of it was caught on tape, people say, what happened there? Sandra Bland, a portion of it caught on the trooper's camera, asking still, what happened there? Eric Garner, uh, the, uh, I think the example that people um, put up as the, the what we thought would be um, a clear point of why body cameras work, no mm -hmm. indictment there. So are people putting too much confidence in body cameras and not enough on some of the legislative changes and perhaps even the, the change of the demography of those in charge of these cities? Yeah. Uh, excellent, excellent question. The body cameras can point to uh, a problem. Uh, they can point to an injustice. But the fact of the matter is you have to rely on the law in order to hold these police officers uh, accountable. Uh, we saw that, uh, for example, in Ferguson, a law that the NAACP passed uh, that, that called for the collection of statistics. That allowed the Department of Justice to hold the Ferguson Police Department accountable. So you need both the technology and the law, which is precisely why we're marching from Selma, Alabama to Washington, D.C., to push for and pass the Human Racial Profiling Act to push for and pass the Law Enforcement Integrity Act. In other words, it's not enough for us to simply view on videotape these brutalities occurring, these tragedies occurring. We have to hold these police departments accountable. And one of the things we have to do in accord with that is also train our police officers. When we see instance after instance of routine traffic stops leading to, in effect, the imposition of the death penalty, so if you miss a turn signal, if you uh, are missing a license plate, or you're not carrying your, 
the driver's uh, registration, you subject to the death penalty, that is a patent violation of our constitutional and our moral values. And so the point being here, uh, we're in a moment where we, it's not enough for us to sit and watch the videotape. We've got to change the laws, which is why we're taking thousands of people into Washington, beginning of August 1, landing there September 16th in D.C., and we're going to walk the halls of Congress by the thousands to change uh, racial profiling in this country. And, and Wesley, let me bring in, again, these numbers that you have reported of the four um, criminal charges that were uh, filed against police officers and the death of a citizen. Two um, also involved white officers shooting black men. The third victim was white. All three were captured on video. But I want to play this video just in from Massachusetts, a police detective telling a driver that he would, quote, put a hole in his head. Let's play this. We're working to get that video. I thought they had it ready for us. But um, as I, in the video, um, which has been played a lot this morning, there's an officer in plain clothing. Uh, let's play it, please. <laughs> And this plays into, um, Wesley, what Cornell was talking about, policing in general. We had this segment on the Today Show this morning guiding you through what your rights are and what you should do in these situations. And, and here, this is another example. Of course, and this cuts two ways. First of all, you have what people believe their rights are um, in these circumstances as police officers. And unfortunately, many of us, including myself, prior to Sandra Bland and some other cases, are in fact misinformed about what some of our rights are during these interactions. That our laws give police officers very broad protections. In fact, they can order us out of our cars basically for any reason, according to legal experts I've talked to. And, and so, if you have these so situations arising because of that, um, and that creates a separate conversation about moving with some of those rights of officers should and should not be, but then also a culture of policing and tactics. I remember talking to police experts um, as we do this police shooting database and talking about the idea of even in cases where you have an armed victim, someone who's with a gun who's shot and killed by the police, very often police officers are chasing them through a backyard, jumping over a fence, and then finding themselves in an alley with someone with a gun. So this idea that in many of these cases there might be tactics, de-escalation tactics, simply letting the person flee or or getting away that might lead to the preservation of life. And so what we have is we're having a conversation currently nationally about what we want our police to be valuing. Mm -hmm. Is it preservation of life? Is it something else? Uh, and that's the conversation we're, I think, currently beginning to have. All right. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Wesley Lowry, as well as the President CEO of the NAACP Cornell Books. Thank you both. Great thank to you. See you. Still ahead, the search goes on, but hope is fading as two Florida...